Good morning. Welcome to worship. Whether here in person or watching on the internet, welcome to morning worship back in the sanctuary of North Springfield Church. This sixth Sunday of Eastertide, thanks to worship and music committee members Gary, Denny, Rob, and Bill, who moved all the fixtures back up from the social hall yesterday. If you're here in person, please be sure your phone is silenced. As you may have noticed on the way in, our Raise the Lift campaign total went up last week to 4,378. That's almost 10% of our goal. <clears throat> Remember this money already spent to make the social hall fully accessible. The campaign is to replenish our investment account. A week from today is Palm Sunday. Your palm fronds are on order to wave around. The chancel choir is practicing a special number. Orders for Easter lilies are being taken through next Sunday. There is a form in your bulletin. <clears throat> also, there's a sign-up sheet for Easter breakfast, which we will have uh, Easter Sunday morning prior to the service. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out in the narthex. Uh, if you can help, we'd Love to share Easter breakfast with all of you. So don't be shy, sign up. <clears throat> Are there any other announcements? Jan? <coughs> um, our one great hour sharing will be received next week. If you forget, we'll still accept it on Easter Sunday as well. And I have a minute for mission. Restoring dignity to India's most oppressed. While the economic and social status of women may be improving marginally worldwide, the life of the Dalit women in India remains unchanged. Dalit is a word from Sanskrit and Hindi that literally means oppressed or broken. Dalits are forbidden to draw water from the common well, from entering temples, are given the leftovers thrown away by the higher caste, and are barred from the right to education. Formerly known as untouchables, the delete women who make up nearly 16% of the female population face not only gender bias, but also caste-based discrimination and economic injustice. For Smitha Krishnan, this cruel existence was an everyday reality. A trained seamstress, Smitha was left as the sole provider for her family when her husband died just before India's last tsunami. Not only did she lose her husband, but she also lost the thatched and mud house and everything in it, including her only means of making a living, a sewing machine. The destruction of my old sewing machine, which was my only source of income, and the death of my husband, leaving me with five kids to take care of, made life extremely tough for me and my kids, she said. Thanks to a grant to provide shelter and sewing machines, among other essentials from Presbyterian Disaster Assistance and the Society for National Integration through Rural Development, or SNRD, as it's, it's known, Smitha and her family face a more hopeful future. SNRD, a non-government organization that has been instrumental in helping the people of India overcome natural and human-made disasters, has received support through Presbyterian's gifts to one great hour of sharing. Because of these generous gifts, thousands of people are able to cope with the impact of tsunamis, flooding, and the COVID pandemic. One great hour of sharing's purpose of helping neighbors in need around the world remains constant, giving us a tangible way to share God's love, not only through the ministries of Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, but also through the Presbyterian Hunger Program and self-development of peoples. Smith's words tell the whole story. Because of people's gifts to one great hour of sharing, we now live in a permanent and disaster-resistant shelter. My kids are back in school. I am able to feed and clothe them. And when they get sick, I am able to take care of their medication too. Thank you, Presbyterian Dis Disaster Assistance and SNRD, and may the Lord continue to provide for those who continue to give to one great hour of sharing. Please give what you can to one great hour of sharing. When we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. David? Uh, 
Uh, related to the retirement of Kathy Ulrich, the uh, Executive Presbyterian Stated Clerk, the uh, session on behalf of the congregation did make a donation to one charity that uh, Kathy Ulrich had in mind, and this is a thank you note from Kathy Ulrich. Uh, David Kleiner and North Springfield, thank you so much for your kind words of support and for your friendship. I am grateful for your thank thoughtful contribution to Haiti Education Foundation. Your kindness will touch many lives. May God's grace continue you to surround may continue to surround you and guide you. Blessings and peace, Kathy. And related to that, uh, the session discussed uh, uh, providing help to uh, East Palestine and the problems they're having down there with the results of the train derailment. And uh, the session on behalf of the congregation made a contribution to one of the major relief organizations in that, uh, that part of the state, uh, uh, an organization called Way Station. And this is a thank you from that organization. On behalf of the Way Station, thank you for partnering with us to care for the residents of East Palestine, Ohio. Blessings, the Way Station board and staff. Um, before we do this next thing, I just want to tell everybody you aren't in a time warp. Uh, this is actually uh, the fifth Sunday in Lent not the eighth Sunday of Eastertide. So, <laughs> so the fifth, this is the fifth Sunday of Lent. We didn't sleep through or, you know, whatever, uh, through Easter and all of that. So fifth Sunday in Lent. Um, I wondered if Janet, you and Ed would come come up, please. Don't be shy. First of all, we want to thank you for all you've done for this North Springfield Church for so long. And uh, at, the, at the session meeting, uh, they made a proclamation, so I'm just going to read it to you. It's in a letter form. Dear Janet and Ed, at the stated session meeting of North Springfield Presbyterian Church on March 14th, 2023, the session voted to formally commend and thank you both for your service as custodians of the North Springfield Church Sanctuary. On behalf of the members and friends of North Springfield Church, we express our love and appreciation for the years of faithful service you have both unconditionally given to your church family. Thank you for your dedication and devotion to the North Springfield congregation. We look forward to your continued participation in the life and ministry of North Springfield Church in new and different ways. And this is from me and from the North Springfield Church session. Here you go. This is yours. This is yours. When I wrote my note of retirement to David, I reminded him that I'm going to be 85 in August, and I'd given 22 years, and I followed Frank Williams, which I always thought was a privilege to do. But I told David, I wanted to do some things 
that I didn't have time for one thing and another? Well, my two daughters and I went on a week-long cruise. Yay! <laughs> and I'm amazed about what wonderful things there are out there. <laughs> So when are you going again, right? Well, yes, as soon as I can work it around. Yeah. And stuff. But it was kind of interesting. I said I think the highlight of the cruise was not listening to Ed say, Mom, 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 Mom. mom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this church is more than a church. It's our home. It's our home, and I always yeah. felt it was my privilege. Oh. Privilege. Oh. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Let us gather now for the call to worship. You may stand if you are able. Come, listen for a word from our God. God, God is calling us to the valley. Us. God offers hope when we have lost our way. The Spirit breathes life into our dry bones. Our souls wait for the refreshment God offers. Come, let us worship our God. God of steadfast love, bring new life to this community of your people. We are eager to hear your voice and be filled with your spirit. Come from the four winds, O oh, breathe and bring vitality and purpose to our gathering, that we would be energized and encouraged. Hear our voices, lifted in praise and crying out from our need. Be attentive to our supplications, we pray, in Jesus' name. We come to the font to remember that the font connects our confession of sin, with the grace and cleansing of our baptism, and with our baptismal call every day to new life in Christ.
If it is true that God has recorded our failings, we hope it will never be published. But in truth, if the book was opened, every page would be blank, for God forgives everything we have done or failed to do. So let us wait for God's mercy and grace as we come with our prayers for forgiveness. We are set free by your saving grace, generous God. Yet we must confess how we are still bound by our pride and arrogance. We seem unable to throw off the great clothes of our habitual sin, finding them too comfortable to wear. We cling to our fears, for they are so familiar and make such good companions. Yet there in every corner of our lives, in every shadow we fear, you come. We break the bonds of sin and terror, giving us new strength and hope for the journey, and calling us to new life through the love and sacrifice of Jesus. Let us take this time of silence for personal reflection and confession. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. If Jesus Christ dwells in you, the Spirit of God will be your life, and the grace of God will be your righteousness. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, then God, who has raised Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies. This is the good news of the gospel. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please turn to one another with words of peace and reconciliation. For those of you at home, the peace of Christ be with you. Lord, we wait for you, and in your word we trust. By the power of your Holy Spirit, set our hearts and minds on the source of life and peace. As the word is read and proclaimed, show us who we are, bearers of good news and messengers of resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these words from the Old Testament from the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There they were, very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath on you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. 
So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in a responsive reading of Psalm 130, which is written in your bulletin. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear the voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Hear this re reading from the New Testament from the book of Romans. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel according to John, the 11th chapter. Let us listen for what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, 
said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light. In your truth we may find freedom. And in your will we may discover new life. Amen. In the year 586 B.C., Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians who then took away to Babylon the very best and brightest of that nation. A temple priest named Ezekiel was one of the ones taken away, exiled, to Babylon. While there, he was called by the Lord to prophesy in great mystic visions to the people of the exile and in writing to those back home of God's judgment and also of God's restoration and promise. The valley of the dry bones is one of his most famous visions. Did you notice this phrase from the Ezekiel reading? They said, our bones are all dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. The people have no hope at all. Desolation and depression, gloom and sorrow are everywhere. And they are not in Babylon by choice. Can you feel the devastation Ezekiel conveys that the Israelite people felt in exile? Can you feel their hopelessness? But actually, Ezekiel's message to them is that there is always hope. When confronted with defeat, gloom, sickness, disappointment, loss, and death, we also are tempted to ask, can these bones live? And that's exactly where Ezekiel is in our reading this morning. But the question, mortal, Can these bones live? Is asked by God, who already knows the answer. And so Ezekiel gives him the only answer there is. Oh, Lord God, you know. And the answer God gives, of course, is, yes, these bones can live. To ask, can these bones live, is to reach the point of rebirth of faith or the birth of new faith. It's out of the death of hope that the hope of life springs. But we're not always or even usually ready for it. As Alexander Graham Bell once said, when one door closes, another opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we don't see the one that has opened to us. Can these bones live? Of course. Always. More doors open for us all the time. Hope and joy can spring from the pain of loss, but it takes a 
willingness to step away from the apparent loss and grow with the situation, taking a broader view of life. Ezekiel has this message of hope for people who have lost all hope. There is a God who can achieve the impossible, but the human end of it is to continue in the knowledge of that God. Can these bones live? Oh, Lord God, you know. And if it's true, and it is, that Ezekiel's powerful words about a raised people from dry, seemingly dead bones is a story about national restoration and the faithfulness of God to his covenant with God's people, then our gospel lesson for today brings that very same good news to every believer. The hopelessness of the people of Ezekiel's day is heard loud and clear in Martha's argumentative hopelessness. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Then later at the tomb, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. It's as if Mary, or Martha, I'm sorry, it's as if Martha is standing in the valley of dry bones, completely cut off, and she's saying, she's crying out, it's no use. In times of severe grief, present sorrow dims the prospect of future joy. And when the imagination is distraught, it's death, not life, that's more apt to seem like the ultimate reality. The lessons for the exiles in Babylon and for Mary and Martha six centuries later are the same. In neither lesson do we have the proclamation of human immortality, but rather of the power of God's word over all things even death. Faced with our helplessness at the death of loved ones or loved things, we are to hear the steady and powerful word of God in the midst of our hopelessness, in the valleys littered with the dry bones of lost hope. There God comes saying, Mortal, can these bones live? Again? Except that God asks it. This is a, an absurd question. But with God, who breathes the very breath of life into our being, is both appropriate and renewing. To the writers of Genesis and Ezekiel, the difference between true life and actual death was possession of God's breath or spirit, Ruah. And so appropriately, today, we will sing, Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. In a valley with parched bones of the dead, God's spirit asks, Mortal, can these bones live? At the doorway to Lazarus' tomb, Christ asked Martha, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? In the broken pieces of our lives, when hope is lost and courage falters, just at the moment when the horizon is shrouded with the fog of our self-doubt, even with doubt about God, in that moment, God comes to those who will listen. Always, God meets us in our desolation, offering us an alternative to our defeat. God's exiled people were so dried up that they couldn't see anything but, devasta but devastation. And they couldn't feel anything except isolation. They needed Ezekiel to open their eyes and to help them feel the wind of the Spirit as the Lord was breathing new life into their souls. 
Can we honestly give the humble Ezekiel's response, O oh Lord God, you know, to God's great offer of love and mercy? Who is God telling to preach to our bones? What words do we need to hear for our lives today? How do we open ourselves up to that living breath of the Spirit? God is so, so willing to breathe into us and fill us once more with the transformation that allows us to be part of the kingdom of God. Can we envision our bones with new flesh and blood? Can we work with the Spirit to prepare ourselves for the resurrection of Jesus? For our own resurrection? Prophesy to these bones. Prophesy to the breath. The Lord God commands him. And so Ezekiel tells them, where our hearts have been brittle and dry as bones, God's spirit can move and bring new life. Where joy has been drained away and replaced with hardened hearts, God can cause new hope to spring forth. Where we see nothing but old bones and painful endings, God envisions an explosion of life. Friends, Ezekiel reminds us that the wind of God's Spirit is blowing in our midst today, giving us new life, giving us new energy. All we need to do is open our eyes to see what that looks like and then open our arms to show others what that feels like. As we prepare this week to march with Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, we know that God's word brings life. <clears throat> As we leave this Lenten journey, we don't depart from a valley of bones and brittle endings, but instead we leave behind a legacy of new life in God's abundant spirit. So hear the word of the Lord which is the word of life, the word of hope, the word of new beginnings. A prelude, if you will, for what is to come. And here again, God's promise to the exiles in Babylon and to all of us. So long as you have me, you have life. I will put my spirit within you, and you will live. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit that we might be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Now let us say what we believe using our affirmation of faith, which is written in your bulletin, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Shall we be seated for prayer? <clears throat> Gathered together as God's beloved children, let us join our hearts and minds in prayer for the church, the world, and all in need. Good and gracious God, compassionate and caring, we thank you that our sufferings are not undergone apart from your watchful eye and care. We thank you that you know when your children hurt. We thank you that Jesus, the resurrection and the life, walked with those who went through difficult valleys, cared for those who grieved, and was touched by their sorrow. We need your assistance with us on our life journeys. Be with each of us when we walk through darkness and as we seek to keep our lives in perspective. <clears throat> you are the Lord. You have spoken and you will act. Give your church universal and the faithful of this congregation confidence that in this life, you feed us with your word and answer our every prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You breathe into our dry bones and we live. We pray for all creatures that creep or swim or fly or run, for the universe, the solar system, and for our fragile planet. Help us to better care for all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You open our graves and bring us up from death. We pray for those who are afraid, for those who live in fear and hiding, for those who have buried too many loved ones. We pray for all those whose lives have been affected by gun violence and mass shootings. We pray for the people of Ukraine as they endure horrific atrocities at the hands of the Russian invaders of their country. We pray for all who have suffered any kind of loss through natural disasters. We pray uh, for those people in Mississippi who lost loved ones and homes in the tornado on Friday evening. We continue to pray for the people of Syria and Turkey and for the people of California. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You wept at Lazarus' tomb, and you weep with us when we mourn. We pray for those who are grieving, those who are depressed those who are homeless or hungry, those suffering the disease of addiction. Bring healing to all those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit. Especially today we pray for those on the prayer list of North Springfield Church, for Denny and Joan, 
for Terry, for Kim, Rosemarie, and Dawn, and for all those that we now name in our hearts, either silently or aloud. For my fifth great grandchild came a little early, five pounds, one ounce. Her name is Eloise Lane Dorman, my daughter Kelly's second, third grandchild. Her prayers uh, for her continued growth and rejuvenated in the Cleveland Hospital. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Vicki. For Sarah. Gail and Steve. Jack. Charlie. For Kayla. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are our Messiah and teacher. We thank you for giving us examples of faithful living in the saints who have gone before us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Without the breath of God, we are dry bones, and without the word of God, we are dust. So with the gratitude of every fiber of our being, let us offer our very lives to the Lord of all life. Please pray with me. Holy God, breath of life, we we thank you for raising us us up and joining us together as one people, your people, flesh and bone, in the body of Christ. As you continue delivering us from death to life, use our lives to proclaim the good news of new life in Christ. Amen.
Now let us go forward with God's hope, Christ's light, and the steadfast love of the Spirit to put flesh on our faith, to call others to new life, and to share the hope that all people everywhere long for. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day your whole life long. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen.